Okay. Welcome to the KS Common Metrics Working Group meeting for April 15th. We have, uh, we have a few things on the agenda today. So um, bot activity is a common metric. So this is something that came up in the DNI working group. So we'll talk about that. Um, we can go through a review of open issues and PRs, and then we can talk about progress on current metrics. We'll probably probably skip the time waiting for submitter action since Sean just, just told me that he can't make this event. So we'll probably punt that one to next time. They added something at the end too. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, common user story, cool. Um, do we want to add that up before we talk about progress on current metrics? Because yeah, those sometimes fine. get long. I'm totally fine. Yep. I'll just move that, I'll move that up a bit. Cool. Um, is there anything else we need to talk about? Because I missed, I missed the last meeting, so I, I kind of looked through the agenda. And it looked like the only action item was for Sean, who's not here. I think you got it. Okay. Um, Cool. So uh, Matt, do you want to talk more about the bot activity as a common metric? Yeah, so it, it kind of, <clears throat> to me at least, it's fairly self-explanatory. So um, just we had been talking about, obviously, the high presence of bots in projects. And I mean, we had even done, you had kind of pointed out like the, the level of engagement that bots can have inside of a repository. And it's probably something we need to be explicit about mm -hmm. just because there's so much filtering that needs to be done on bots when you're asking questions about kind of human activity. So yeah, if you're just looking at things like time to close on an issue, like, or I'm sorry, um, time to first response on an issue, if you don't filter out on bots, like you can make your project look amazing. So, so it's just probably something that, and I think this fits well in common because it would fit potentially in a variety of different spots. Yeah, agreed. Um, and, and the extent to which some of these projects use bots. So particularly in the cloud native space where I do a lot of work. So like in, in Kubernetes, you, you issue commands to the bots and the bots actually do all the things. So there's no like, like a, a human being doesn't merge a pull request. That's a pull even, request even. gets merged That's by the bot after it gets an LGTM and a slash, a slash LGTM and a slash approve from someone who's on the, in a file that says that they're allowed to approve. And then the bot sees that these commands have been met and all the tests pass and then the thing gets merged. So like, that's like the extreme automation case with bots. I mean, even Matt Snell in the badging program, I mean, he does, he does something similar. I mean, he does, when the badging process is over, he issues an end command and everything's get wrapped up based on that command. And on the other end, the bot is always the first to respond to the yeah. submitters just saying, thanks. So kind of have a couple different scenarios, even in, even in badging. Yeah. Yeah, the bots are the bots are super useful, and I think they're becoming a lot more common um, in use lately. Because I think you know we have we just have tooling that do does this a lot better than than it used to. And I know that when I do when I do metrics for VMware, one of the first things I do on the time to first response is filter out as many of the bots as I can possibly find. So then the question is, are we measuring the bots activity or we are just focused on how to filter the bots? That's a good question. Um, I don't know, because we haven't we haven't written this metric yet. <laughs> I think we probably we probably need to do. Yeah, I'm not sure that this is a single metric or if this is if this is multiple metrics. I mean, I think that there's certainly a metric around the volume of bot activity, which is kind of what, you know, what's been documented here. But I do think that bot activity is something that would be a filter on a lot of other metrics. I agree, I was about to say the same thing. Yeah, Georg, how does, um, how does the, the Grimoire Labs tool set handle handle bots like how do you, you you filter you have an option to filter those out right yes so 
in Grimoire Lab, we have the sorting hat, which is responsible for the identities. And in sorting hat for any actor, uh, any profile, you can say this is a bot account. And then you can filter by bot activity. So it sounds like this is yet another of the things that comes up in the common working group that we've actually implemented in our tools, but not defined as a metric. <laughs> So then it would be the metrics would be volume of bot activity. Is that right? I don't know if I can spell. Is that one of them? Um, yeah. I think we also might want to look at the like what triggers the bot. Like if it's a, if it takes manual intervention, then yeah, it's a bot, but somebody still had to do something. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a big difference between like an automated response, thanks for your PR, than like the, the thing that Matt runs at the end. Cause there's a lot of work that goes into making that run and making sure that it's ready to go. So um, that might be a filter or something. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's something that I think Matt and I were kind of exchanging some emails about earlier earlier this week was um, because we talked about the spot activity and then I was I was issuing a PR in the Knative um, repository and if you add brackets and WIP in front of it it adds a, a do not merge tag or do not merge label to the um, to the pull request and then when you edit the descript edit the title and pull the WIP out because you're ready for it to you know to go then it removes that that label. So in that action, like both of those times, I, I triggered something, but the bot actually did it. Then the question is also like, how do we identify the activity, whether it is from a bot or a human? That is also a challenge I come across when I was like analyzing some of the repos in the different domains. That's actually a huge challenge um, because a lot of the bots aren't named bots. Um, uh, this is one thing that I've found in the VMware data is we have there's one bot that's like it's called CFCR or something that uh, and you know we have uh, like CICD bots that are named strange things and we have automated accounts that are not intuitively named things but you start to once you start to dig into the data and you look at the data, you're like, wow, that's gotta be a bot. And you go out and you look at it and you're like, yep, that's a bot. I've got to filter that one out. But it's not, it's not obvious. I mean, I think that's what Georg was saying was you kind of you kind of have to identify some of the accounts that are bots in order to be able to reliably filter them out. Yeah. Um so what are the next steps on this metric? Do we, have we added it to the metrics spreadsheet yet? No, I'm starting to make the Google, the Google Docs at the moment. And the two oh, cool. that I've made are <laughs> ratio of human to bot activity, and then just volume of bot activity. Those are the two at the moment. Okay, cool. So can I give you that action item uh, to create issues and docs for these? Yes. Uh, are you thinking of these two as the two separate metric or a filter within a metric? Like uh, bot activity and then is a filter can be volume or ratio to human to bot activity. Yeah, I think they both could. So if I look at say like new issues, just new issues. Um, or new contributors, right? Um, I mean, I could filtering on just the volume of bot activity in this narrow window or closed issues or closed merge requests. So I think that would definitely be a filter to me, just the pure volume. Mm -hmm. And then the ratio might be interesting too. If I mean, it'd be interesting, like I think some of the the descriptions that Don, you had described, the ratio might actually be zero. 
or <laughs> like, like, like it sounds like humans don't necessarily merge the PRs. But they do like, issue the commands. So they do type in like, you know, slash okay. LGPM in a comment or slash approve in a comment. So there's, so, you know, some It's funny. Yeah, it makes it funny. Like when you're taking a look at who's doing the merging, like um, in that scenario, the, the human is pushed somewhere in the chain that we might not otherwise look. Mm -hmm. Just when we're looking at huge volumes of data you know, you might not be looking in the right place for where the human is actually kind of prodding the bot to do the work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Kind of reduces transparency. It, it does, that's super interesting. So Matt, in your ratio uh, example, so would it be something like, um, so like the, the human issues the command, so that's like one interaction, but then the bot does like five things to get it merged and deletes the branch and closes the issue and does all the other things. So that would be like five or whatever. So it'd be, is that, is that kind of what you're thinking or no, I, to like all of the regular just comments and stuff like that? I know. I mean, I was wondering like, is, and maybe we will never have a ratio. Like once a bot is created for a repository, um, the, the human will never do that bot activity ever. So once a bot is created to issue labels, in the case that you had talked about, Don, can humans still issue labels? I would assume um, they can. In the Kubernetes landscape, um, you, you issue commands to the bot to add the label. Okay, um, so I do believe that people who are administrators on the repository can directly override the bot stuff and manually change things. Okay, but that okay. number is like, it's, it's just a handful of people for, for obvious reasons. But Kubernetes is sort of like the very much at scale example. Yeah, so it's like, it's like slash, I think it's like slash label and then the label or something like that. Yeah, that, that is correct. I've, I've looked at Kubernetes bot activity. Uh, yeah. In that particular case, it actually improves transparency in the project uh, and kind of distributes some of that uh, admin rights to people that otherwise wouldn't have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's actually the, the whole purpose of the bot is because when you're looking at something on the scale of Kubernetes, there are lots of people who need to do things and the GitHub permissions are not as granular as, as what we needed for a lot of things. So in order to issue a lot of these commands to the, um, the bot, you do in a lot of cases have to be what we call an org member. So, so which requires, I think like two people to say, yeah, that person's legit. And, then, um, and so there's, you know, call it a contributor ladder. There's certain steps that you have to take in order to be able to get there, to be able to issue certain things to the, to the bots. Would there ever be a scenario that like totally making this up, but like an issue might be closed by a bot because it's old, but an issue could still be closed by a human just because the issue is done. Cause like what you described on, there's really no ratio question. Like it's just, it's where the human event occurs mm -hmm. to kick the bot to do it. Um, but there, so there, there, there is still a ratio because I mean, so that's all the bot activity, but there are also like loads of comments and reviews and stuff that happens sort of natively within the pull request. Okay. So you still, you still leave comments on it and say, Hey, you know, I think this would be better if it was worded like this, or gotcha. I think this data structure would be better optimized or, you know, whatever kind of feedback you would give on a pull request, you still that give them some comments and you still do code reviews in the traditional like GitHub style of code reviews. And the the bot the bot itself may have admin privileges, but that doesn't mean that other people don't have admin privileges either. So it, I would I would imagine that anything a bot can do, a maintainer or admin can do as well, and they probably yeah. still do to some degree, although maybe not as maybe not as much. Yeah, in Kubernetes, it's pretty rare um, because we really want people to interact with the bots. Um, but you know, if something 
if something just went sideways and got really messed up, um, you know, maintainers that admins for the repository could step in and, and fix things. Okay, so what what you just described was not what I was thinking, but it makes more sense than what I was thinking. So I think what you're describing is like there would be the start the start of a pull request, somebody issues a PR, and then that PR ends somehow, whether it's merged or just you know closed without merging. And then the question is the ratio of activity within that open PR between bots and humans. And then the same could be asked of an issue, right? The time an issue opens to the time the issue closes. And then the ratio of activity between humans and bots within that activity, the activity being an issue here. Is that yeah, I mean, I can, here, we can kind of look at an example. Maybe that would, maybe that would help. I just pulled up a random issue from, from one of the Kubernetes repositories. Uh, like, thinking from yeah. that perspective, it feels like very granular rather than a project level comparison. So we are looking at a one particular issue and within that, the ratio is that. Yes, yes. And I was, I was at the more at the project level, like the ratio of the number of issues closed by a bot versus the number yes. of issues, which this makes more sense. Yeah, because you can, so you can kind of see this, like somebody issues a PR, they talk about what it does. And then there's the bots add things like, you know, the CLA, the size, it adds a um, like an area and a SIG. And then, you know, a person came in and said, you know, hey, here, here are some, some things that I think you need for this. Can you, can you scroll up for a second again? How did the, did someone tell the bot the tags or did the bot gets the tags? Um, in this case, the, these are tags that the bot guesses. Oh, interesting. Or has information. I'm, I think, I think the, the area and the SIG depend on maybe the, the area of the code that they're changing, mm -hmm. possibly. So I, I, know, I know Kubernetes had a bot whose purpose at one point was just to guess what the label was. And I'm, I'm assuming that functionality has now been merged into K8 SCI robot. It was, it was a separate bot prior. Oh, maybe. Um, I mean, this is all, it's, it's Prowl was the robot. Um, I think, yeah, there I was feel a bot, like they've renamed. There was a bot called Elect, but this, I think this is the, the main bot they use. There was a bot called Alexa bot that used to do this. I think it was run by one of the core developers. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I haven't seen the Alexa bot. I assume that that was probably merged into the the Prowl um, yeah. bot functionality. But yeah, it's some combination of guessing and some combination of knowing based on based on where in the code base the the changes are. And so it adds these. And so the the CLA it adds, you know, like like our CLA bot does, or our it's like our DCO bot does. The size is automatically determined based on number of lines or something like that. Um, but then you do have, you know, individual people making suggestions and doing typical, typical code reviews. And then you see it gets a LGTM from somebody. There was a, this is how you add a label. So this merge label, another LGTM. And then the bots reminding us that it's not approved. It still needs a slash approved, um, which apparently somehow got added. In, in, in looking at uh, the bot data, that's the, that was, a, or in looking at Kubernetes bot activity, that was sometimes a, a problem for me, uh, trying to figure out uh, how the bot made the decision to improve it in this case, for example. Like did someone, yeah. did, was it done out of band? Was it a- uh... No, okay, so I know what happened here. Um, the, there's two LGTMs here, uh -huh. um, and a bot needs a slash LGTM and a slash approved. But if one of these people is in the owner's file and they're allowed to approve things, if they put the LGTM command on, it's treated like a slash approved. Oh, interesting. And there's been a lot of discussion in the Kubernetes community as to whether that should be true because it decreases the transparency of it. And it isn't always clear like what happened. Awesome. Thank you. That actually that but I'm pretty I mean, so I'm like 90. 
90% sure that's how that worked. Okay. Okay, have we talked enough about bots? Yeah, it's super, super interesting. It is absolutely <laughs> fascinating. I just yeah. like, like you said, Matt, you just end up down this rabbit hole of how did this happen and where did this come and from? I just keep looking at this and I'm like, what will pull requests look like in a year? Yeah. Like, like it's just really fascinating that like the majority, this is the ratio question, the majority of conversation might actually be mm -hmm. little little bot prods by people and then the bot does things. Yeah. Like that's so interesting. Yeah. Fascinating, okay. Yep. And in, in some cases it increases transparency and in some cases it reduces transparency. Mm-hmm. That's the, that's so, the part I kind of find interesting. Yeah. So, so in terms of the two metrics, then is um, the ratio makes a ton of sense to me at this point, kind of what you had just shown, Don. Does the volume make sense? Just the pure volume of bot activity? Like, do I, do I care that there were 80, 80 bot things in this PR? I would say at the aggregate level uh, for an entire repo bot uh, volume do matters. Like if you want to look at the aggregation level from the activity perspective. Okay. And I guess maybe over time it starts to matter if I'm just looking at pure volume today and, versus. And the other things so you've got ratio of human to bot activity, but in the volume of bot activity, it might also be interesting to people might be interested in the volume of different bots. So, you know, it's not unusual to have multiple bots. Right, okay. All right, well, I'll, I'll for that action item, I'll do these things on these two, the ratio, ratio one of, right now at this point, I'm calling it ratio of human to bot action within an activity. I can change that. And, what what do we want to do about the bot as a filter for other metrics? Because I know that's how I've, Lab already has it. Go ahead, Georg. I just captured it in here, and my thought was a concerted effort to go through all of the metrics we have and issue pull requests to just add it where it makes sense. Okay. I don't think having a separate document describing a metric only saying, hey, bots could be a filter on all these other, no. I don't think that Can makes I give sense. Can you the action item to, to do that? That's a lot of pull requests. <laughs> yeah, I can do it. Okay. At least start the process and then maybe we can kick it off in some of the other working groups to do some of their own. Yep, sounds good. Okay. The next thing we have on the anything else on bots? I know I've asked this like six times, and then we keep going down the rabbit hole. Because it's so cool. <laughs> um, review of open issues and PRs. Um, so this one is relatively new. So I think Ritik is on the call. I don't know if I said that right, but do you want to talk a little bit about this one? I don't think we can hear you. It looks like you went off mute. Still not, no. No. I can uh, also talk about it and then hopefully Ritik can get the microphone working. Cool. Uh, no, Ritik, we cannot hear you. Oh, I think now it works. Oh, hey, hello. You're very quiet. Okay, I'm literally shouting right now. Oh, this is perfect. Oh, you can hear now. Yeah. Okay, okay, sorry. 
Yeah, so I have a list of two tasks before resolving this issue. The first one would be to add the working group uh, repository template to the community handbook. Thanks, Georg, for creating that new page. And the second would be to uh, removing this template. Uh, uh, wait a second, let me search. Yeah, the second one is to remove this uh, template directory from the working group common and replicate this in the three position that Georg said. Uh, first one is in the community handbook itself. The second one would be in the chaos slash metrics re uh, repository. And the uh, uh, third one would be in the repository structure page. Then the last thing would be just to delete this uh, template repository and I think the issue would be resolved. Don, you're muted. I'm on mute and talking to myself. So to make sure I understand, uh, what we're what we're doing with this is where we're basically taking the templates out of the individual working group um, repositories and creating a standardized template yeah, yeah. place, which is so. So this is great. Thank you so much. This might be uh, this might be one of those things where in the README, if we have a standard structure for the README in each repository, perhaps we have a pointer that points to the template. Uh, the same way with that we would have a pointer that points to the code of conduct or the uh, so maybe we need to think about this, including that in the standardized working group read me. That's a really good idea too. Cool. All right. Well, hey, thank you so much for your work on this. Um, we have another another issue names and definitions of people I feel like this is yours, Georg, where are we on this one. I need to refresh my memory. Um, what's the title again? Oh, sorry. Oh yeah. Uh, so in our metrics, we refer to people based on the different roles that they play in the different actions and activities they do in open source communities. So contributors, members, people, submitters, authors, reviewers, observers, and Sometimes they're used interchangeably, sometimes even use them interchangeably within the same metric. Uh, and I, I thought, hey, it would be nice to define clearly what each one of those roles are and when to use them to have a more clear metric definition or all of the definitions would benefit from having clearly defined, okay, here we are talking about reviewers only. And it's always the same across all the metrics. I guess this is coming across, uh, I'm hearing this third time, like it was in a uh, general meeting, it was last time discussed in the evolution. Now we are discussing that we need to define some uh, common terms like uh, in, uh, in the risk, it was more on the dependency side here, we are looking at the contributors. That's where I propose the glossary terms that we define different terminologies we use within the metric. So, and then Kevin again uh, suggested on that, that we define those as a metric. But like uh, now the point is, if we define contributor as a metric, then we don't need the glossary. But if we are not defining contributor as a metric, but as a term we are using, then we need a glossary terms to define things. That's my two cents on this. So like uh, my idea is to have a glossary of the terms, those which are not maybe metric, but used within those metrics as a different terminologies. That's a really good point. I do really like the idea of having some common definitions uh, across and, and frankly within the working groups, because I know that I am, I am super guilty of this. It's sort of a, I don't know, I think it's just um, kind of my background and in, in blogging is like you try to, you try to change up the words. You don't want to use the exact same word in every single sentence, um, but that is super imprecise and not probably what we should be doing when we're defining metrics. And so I know I'm, I'm really guilty of this. Academic papers do this all the time too. <laughs> when you're trying to read, like, why, why are we talking about this new group of people now? <laughs> when it's actually the same. Yeah. So uh, the, to the 
uh, to what Vinod had said, uh, my, my point was that uh, creating a glossary kind of creates uh, duplication. And then it's, it's also another document that we have to maintain. And do we maintain that in multiple places? Uh, whereas our, the key purpose of our group is to define metrics and, and metrics are basically our glossary terms, right? So a contributor should be defined and we should include in that definition uh, synonyms. Uh, and at the base level, I think that's, that's the work that we do. So creating a glossary is this, is this second thing that's kind of a duplication and then it's something that needs to be maintained. I'm, I'm hard pressed to think of a term that we would want to define that couldn't be defined as a metric. Uh, perhaps, perhaps I haven't uh, given it an, enough thought, but I, if you give me an example of one that we'd want to define, uh, that would that would completely change my mind, <laughs> so, or my view on it. So, thank you. Maintainer. So maintainer would probably be a metric. So how many maintainers does a project have? And that, that might be something that's worth counting. I, I, I agree with that. Um, but also in case you all didn't see, uh, Georg posted a link to our terminology page that's in our handbook. Um, I did not even know that this was there. So <laughs> thank you, Georg. Because <laughs> this is exactly, I think what we're, we're talking about is a, is a terminology guide of like what we mean when we say these things. And just Greg, Add at the terminology page. So kudos to him, credit to him. Uh, the focus was more on terminologies we use in our day-to-day -day work, not terminology we use in our metrics. And so I think that is what we are talking about now. Well, perhaps it could just be an extra section then. Um, I, okay. I totally agree with, I, I mean, I, I totally understand what you're saying, Kevin, but I also think as a, as a person coming in um, who is, doesn't know anything about chaos, like there, it might be helpful to have just like a high level, quick, you know, um, definition list of this is what we mean. So like if you, when we say maintainer, this is what we mean. And also here's the metric that we use to measure this. Um, Cause if, you know, I just think of like somebody who's just looking for that, you know, um, introduction to chaos and they're not sure to make them read through the whole metric just to say what do I mean by maintainer I think might be a little heavy uh heavy-handed so I I don't know I think there is merit in just a quick blurb of like a quick you know reader's digest version of here's what we mean one sentence each so the 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 link that Georg shared these are all basically chaos specific terms right this is about the governance of our project Right, so if we define focus areas in there, things like that, but we're not really talking about open source in general terms, are we? I think he was just providing a place where this could occur. By terms, we are focused here on uh, the discussion is around the terms we use when we are defining a particular metric. Within that metric, we use certain terms, which are not itself a metric somewhere, but we are using those terms and having a clear definition of those terms is important. That is a discussion, I think. So this is a document that would have to be maintained and it would have to be maintained in relation to all of the metrics that we define. Uh, and we need to make sure that we are consistently using these, these terms. Uh, but once again, so well, the, there's duplication here. So is the, is contributor the way it's defined here the same as the way we define contributor as a metric? I think like a word like community, which we use a lot in our metrics can mean different things either in individual metrics or just in general. Like, do we mean people who use the software, who contribute to the software, who follow the project on Twitter, who have interacted with them once? Like, I think like a term like that would be helpful to confine 
Um, and maybe that is a metric, like how many members are in your community. So that probably is a metric and there's different filters on how you measure that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think there is merit in, in the discussion for sure. I'm just taking some notes in the issue itself. Does that capture your concerns, Kevin? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. So sadly, we we lost Georg halfway through that that discussion. Um, so. But we have the we have the notes so we can come back to this. This is just the, the issues review. But that was a great discussion. Thank you. I, I feel like I feel like it's something we need, but I do think that um, I think you're right, Kevin. We need to think very carefully about how we do this so that we don't end up with definitions all over the place and duplication. Yeah, I'm I'm just saying if if a term needs to be defined, we probably need to define it as a metric. Yep. No, I agree. Oh. Well, but oh, let me make one comment on that. We have, so we have the, we do have the metric called contributors and I was taking a look at it and it is really about the number of contributors is what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. So like the example that I gave of maintainers, like maintainers, like how do we define maintainers? But then Kevin, you had said like the number of maintainers. So to me, these are two slightly different things. Like how do, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead and finish. That's fine. Well, I was just going to say, well, that's the that's the issue that we have with all of our metrics, right? So we we define what it is, and then we provide just kind of a general, like this is one way that you might look at it, right? Uh, every metric can be viewed as a count, uh, for the most part, right? If it's if it's change requests, we can we define change requests, but then we we offer some way of looking at change requests. So, uh, you know, what we've defined this change request, it's a thing, hey, let's count them. Uh, so, so everything's kind I mean, of a count. They're not all counts. I don't think every metric is a count. Uh, I mean, I, I'm kind of generalizing a little bit, but there's, there's always some sort of measurement that we include in it. Uh, but, oftentimes there can be multiple measurements, right? So when you get the purpose of the change request metric in general is to define what a change request is. And it's, it's less important that the, when we look at it, we, we, we offer ways that you could look at it. And one of them is a count, right? Or some metrics are very specific ways of looking at this metric term. Uh, but I don't think, uh, 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 I don't think the inclusion of that measurement means that we're not defining the terms, right? We are defining those terms as metrics. So, so the, the change request metric is, it defines what a change request is. Yeah, I, I agree with Kevin um, with the caveat that we should get a little bit more rigorous about making sure that we do indeed define some of these terms. So when you, when you create the contributor metric, you know, having a really clear definition of by contributor, we mean this. And, and then if we have, um, you know, if things are subcategories of other things. So maybe a maintainer is a type of contributor. Maybe we define that somewhere, either in a new maintainer metric or as a filter on, you know, on a contributor metric. But I think I think we should try to be a bit more consistent about how we use the, the terms. And I think if we create metrics that clearly define each one of these terms, then that would give us something to kind of latch onto. Yeah, OK. I think the others are new metrics. Um, and we don't have, I didn't see Daniel on the call. Um, I don't know that we have, we're about at the end of the time, so we probably don't have time to talk about the, um, so let's, let's talk about, sorry, Matt, let's talk about, com I'm all over the place today. Let's talk about common user story. <laughs> I just realized sure. there's one more thing on the agenda before other metrics. 
No problem. So in the weekly call, I had brought up the idea of what I'm at this point calling user stories. I wouldn't, <laughs> I don't know that story is necessarily something that is the name anymore. Um, but I, I posted one yesterday in DNI, and I'm just trying to post one here. So the idea is to to just try to help people understand how metrics could be brought together and not just metrics like as identified in a focus area, but metrics that might be in part from common, metrics that might be in part from evolution, metrics that might be in part, you know, like how do we aggregate these to answer questions or help people orient themselves? And so here's one I made up like five minutes before this. So I wanna understand the impact that events have on maybe not increase, but traffic in my project, right? And so there's a burstiness metric. We have new issues, closed issues, change requests. So it's kind of like, these are linked anyway through filters, but this would just be a way of kind of drawing it forward to somebody. And then the end of this is, you know, just by understanding these five things together helps me get a better understanding of how events affect project activities. And if I'm not seeing changes in project activities, maybe I wanna change, and I wanted to do that with an event, then maybe I have to change how I present at the event or how we, why we run the event or something like that, right? So if I'm not seeing any, any change, then I probably need to do something about it. So this is just a user story. We just put this out in front of people. Here are metrics that you want, I wanna take a look at. And this is with, with respect to an event. Super short, super sweet. We're, we're ag asking actual users to answer these questions? Or is this being written from the perspective of, of us who is uh, defining and creating the metrics? Um, this is an example of how, if somebody's trying to understand the impact in, that an event has, on activity within a project. This is an example we are providing as the chaos project that might be useful for somebody who hasn't really thought about this before. Okay. So typically I've seen these in kind of kind of this, this format and it's usually something that like, so if you think about it like a traditional product environment, it's usually something that like the product or user experience people come out, you know, and they, uh, and it's something you do within within the project. Yeah, written by the developer or the or the project yeah. team, right? So it's the the perspective. It's you're you're guessing what the user would want to use this for, or based on whatever. Yeah. Research you've done. Research. Yeah, you're building. It's usually based on research, so it's usually based on kind of user experience uh, research, and and then you put together these stories based on the research and it helps you build products. But that feels a little bit different than what Matt was describing. So I'm, I'm curious if I'm on the wrong track. And, and I, was kind of, I was kind of thinking that it might be really interesting to get a user to, to write that sentence. Like, what does this metric actually mean to me? Right, does, it, does that match what we think it means? I'm not, I'm not sure. I think this I, is an awesome, oh, sorry, Vinod. I think this is an awesome uh, way to um, highlight for potential, um, if we were business, potential customers um, to how they can use our metrics. I think that's what Matt was trying to get at. Like, just have some examples of, oh, that applies to me. Oh, I, I want to understand, the, me as a user, I want to understand the impact that my event is going to have on my traffic. How can I measure that? Oh, here's some ways that chaos has packaged up in a, in a nice little box with a bow on top that I can just look at these things and then I'll know if my event was successful. I was thinking of it in two ways, as Elizabeth explained, like first we create some scenarios and define this, okay, I want to assess the impact of a DNA program or something. And then we give it to the users and then we get the feedback, whether they are using it in a similar way or another way that we can add to that. So like we initially come up with some scenarios 
that we assume can be helpful to the user and then we assess them how they are adopting it. So I think, Don, to your point about whether or not what you wrote like kind of matches with what what is here. And I think the answer is, yeah, I was going to make a, so as a whomever that person might be, I want to perform, you know, I want to get a better understanding of the impact that my events have on traffic mm -hmm. um, so that I can, I, I would have to add to it. So, you know, like in order um, to do this, you would use something like that. <laughs> so the 10 seconds that we have to, <laughs> but like to, to help, you know, so as a user, you may want to perform, you may want to get a better underhand understanding of the traffic so that I can understand the relationship between events and traffic. But in order to do that, these metrics might play an important role. But this, so this, this may or may not be helpful for you because the way these usually work is there are a number of user personas. So, you know, we have these at Puppet and like one was a sysadmin, one was a developer, one was a, you know, we had these, these defined personas, but it feels like what you're talking more about is like use cases, which I feel is different than what I just put there as a template. Gotcha. I'm not sure my template works based on the more, the more you talk about it, the less I'm sure that 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 makes sense for us. Gotcha. Okay. I'm trying to make it work. I might just I might just delete it because I think it's gonna be confusing in the notes. I just added that amazing sentence at the end. I know, and now it's gone <laughs> forever. <laughs> Look at that, erasing history. Oh. <laughs> okay, with that, we are one minute over. Um, any any other quick things before we wrap it up? No, thanks for the nice discussion. Yeah, this is good. Thanks. Thanks for bringing it up. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for coming and participating and we will see you again in two weeks on the 29th. Take care, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye.